The Birth of Jesus Christ, Competing Mythologies Unlike Matthew, Luke has no need to slyly substitute Nazarene for Nazarite. By replacing Nazarite, he who vows to grow long hair and serve God, with a term that appears to imply resident of, Matthew is able to fabricate a hometown link for his fictitious hero. Of such duplicity are dreams made. Matthew, Mary, Joseph already live in Bethlehem. Angelic announcements to Joseph in, in dreams. Birth in a house. Celestial signs, star in the east. Genealogy, 42 generations back to Abraham. Actually, only 41 names. Royal ancestry, lineage accentuates Jewishness. Adoration from Magi. Dream-inspired flight to Egypt. Herod's murder of the innocents and the move to a new home in Nazareth. Luke, in contrast, Mary Joseph live in Nazareth. Worldwide census, pretext for birthing in Bethlehem. Angelic announcements to Mary in visions. Birth in manger. Celestial sign, chorus of angels above a sheep pasture. Genealogy, 42 generations back to David, then another 14 generations back to Abraham, and another 21 generations back to God himself. Extended ancestry now includes the Gentiles. Adoration from shepherds. Preparation in the temple, recognised as a light to the Gentiles by prophets. Prodigy in the temple at the age of 12. Return to his hometown, Nazareth. Elaboration of a myth. Neither Mark nor Paul nor any of the other writers of the New Testament letters know of Jesus' birth to a virgin. In fact, they show no awareness of his nativity at all. Though collectively all are earlier writers than Matthew and Luke, they evidently know least about his birth. Perhaps even more surprising, the authors of John, though certainly aware of the birth tales presented by Matthew and Luke, have passed over those stories as unworthy of a mention in their own Gospels. But for all that, the pretty tale of miraculous birth and fulfilment of ancient prophecy has delighted and infused generations of Christians who, with simple faith, are able to weather the harsh storm of rationality and objectivity with a half-wit's beaming smile. Hey, it's Christmas. No nativity yarn in epistles, Mark or John. In the letter to the Galatians, the writer of this particular Pauline epistle stresses one point about the birth of Christ, and it is not the extravagant claim that he was born to a virgin. It is the rather prosaic claim that the birth conformed with Jewish law. In other words, Christ was born a Jew. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son born of a woman born under the law. Galatians 4.4 in the verse that follows, the writer explains that the son was born as a Jew in order that he might redeem others who were also Jews. Nowhere in this or other epistle, for that matter, is there any reference to a virgin called Mary or any other name, bringing forth a child. In the one passage where Paul does discuss virgins, 1 Corinthians 7, the writer says virgins serve the lords better than wives because they are not distracted by the needs of their husbands. The only other occasion where the Pauline writers are at all concerned with the birthing of Jesus is Romans 1, 1 3. And here the reference is to human seed, not the agency of a divine spirit. I, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle and separated unto the gospel of God, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. The Pauline position is unequivocal. The authors know nothing of a supernatural conception and in fact say the opposite. The birth was normal and Jewish, albeit of kingly seed. The author of Mark is another who has no story of a holy virgin or divine impregnation. Mark's Jesus makes his first appearance as an adult, not as a child, and there is no later referral to any supernatural or even natural birth. 
Mark sketches in the barest detail regarding this hero's origin. His Jesus came out of Galilee, emerging from the city of Nazareth for his baptism by John. But that is all Mark has to say on the matter. Perhaps more telling is the treatment of John's Jesus' origin in the Gospel of John. Here the author, though he almost certainly knew the earlier fables dreamed up by Matthew and Luke, like Mark has no interest in any human genesis of his word of God made flesh. John states very clearly that Jesus was the son of Joseph, John 1 642, which could hardly have left Mary a virgin. Again, like Mark, he prefaces his story of Jesus with a preamble about John the Baptist and when the light and the lamb first appears, it is as an adult. Later in his Gospel, John's Pharisees discuss the Christ and they are clearly under the impression that Jesus has no connection with Bethlehem. John 7, a belief shared earlier in the tale by the soon-to-be disciple Nathaniel. Not even the evangelist John is sold on the fantastical virgin birth yarn. Fulfilled prophecy? No, just cut and paste. All this took place to fulfil what the Lord had spoken of by the prophets. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Matthew 1, 23 No one in the New Testament actually calls Jesus Emmanuel. The prophet who supposedly made this prophecy was Isaiah, although Isaiah is at least three writers composing material over a period of 200 years. First, or proto Isaiah, sometime in the 8th, 7th century, wrote, Therefore the Lord himself giveth to you a sign, lo, the virgin is conceiving, and is bringing forth a son, and hath called his name Emmanuel, Isaiah 7.14. Such a literal translation of Isaiah's words still retains a Christian spin. Note, however, that the present tense is used. The context for this supposed messianic prophecy is a world away from Herodian or Roman Judea. The Lord, through Isaiah, is speaking to King Hazaz, the ruler of Judah around 734 or 728 BC. The young woman in question is probably a wife or concubine of Hazaz himself, present among the courtiers addressed by the prophet. She is pregnant, clearly so, hence the behold, and despite the insistence of Ahaz that, that he won't test the Lord, Isaiah is determined to present the woman's imminent birth in as a sign from Yahweh. The sign is not the miracle of a virgin pregnancy, or even a miracle at all. The sign is that the soon-to-be son will quickly learn righteousness and enjoy the favour of the Lord, and that the house of David will prevail. A more accurate rendering of the text would be, Therefore Yahweh himself gives you a sign. Look, the young woman who is pregnant will give birth to a son, and he shall be called Emmanuel. Yahweh is with us. But the sign that as I as identified is the pregnant maiden is incomplete without the verses that follow. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. Isaiah 7, 15 and 16. In other words, before the child eats butter and honey and learns to choose good over evil, surely a choice quite unnecessary for Jesus to learn, Judah's current enemies will be rendered low. The time frame is not centuries but very short. The political military crisis caused by the then occurring assault on Judah from Ephraim, the northern kingdom, Israel, and Damascus, Syria, will, says Isaiah, result in their mutual defeat. The prophet Isaiah is offering reassurance to King Azaz, given in return for his fidelity to Yahweh. Clearly we are not dealing with any Roman province or a Messiah to be born some 700 years into the future and of scant consolation to a king facing imminent defeat. In fact, the prophecy pointed towards Azaz's own son, Hezekiah, 728-698. And that is the surest sign that the sign was actually concocted during the reign of Hezekiah himself. 
And as it happens, Hezekiah is a theophoric name, meaning strengthened by Yahweh. For some later rabbis, Hezekiah fulfilled the messianic hope. For others, that hope would be fulfilled by Hezekiah's return. The Talmud ascribes the Jewish sage Yohanan ben Sakai, 30 to 90 AD, head of the Yebne rabbinic school, with the words, Prepare a throne for Hezekiah, king of Judah, who is coming. Berakot 28b. Other rabbis considered that the Messiah hope had been already fulfilled in the, the historical Hezekiah. Propaganda for a king in peril. In reality, Azaz did not solely trust in Yahweh. He appealed to Assyria and its ruler Tiglath Pileser, who in 732 reduced Judah's enemies, Damascus and Israel. As a result of this alliance with a superpower and to the chagrin of of Yahweh's prophets like Isaiah, Assyrian gods were introduced into Jerusalem and Judah effectively became a vassal to Assyria. When Hezekiah inherited the throne a few years later, it was at the height of Assyrian expansionism. The early years of his reign witnessed the rebellion by the northern kingdom under Hoshea, which provoked the wrath first of Shalmaneser V and then of his successor, Sargon II. As a result, the northern kingdom, based on Samaria, was destroyed in 721 BC, and much of its population, the lost ten tribes, deported. Though in vassalage to Assyria, Judah gained emigre priests from the north, whose presence at the royal court strengthened the hand of the Yahwehs and prompted religious reform and the notions of resistance. And indeed, following Sargon's early death and in collusion with Egypt, Hezekiah found the courage to rebel and launched attacks against neighbouring Assyrian allies. At this juncture, propaganda highlighted the king's favour in the eyes of the Lord, became apposite to Judah's very survival, and Isaiah got to work. Like all prophecy, Isaiah's words were written for a contemporary purpose, but were dressed in the clothes of a similar earlier conflict, in this case one thirty years earlier involving Hezekiah's own father. It assuredly had nothing to do with the birth of a godman far into the future in the time of Herod. Also, like all prophecy, it was worthless. Four years into Hezekiah's rebellion, the Assyrian war machine rolled over Judah, destroying Escalon, Joppa, Lachish, and trapping the Jewish king like a bird in a cage. To survive it all, Hezekiah had to forfeit his entire treasury and strip the gold from the doors of the temple. 2 Kings 18. The humiliated king died within three years, and both his son Manasseh and grandson Ammon ruled but as Assyrian vassals. With the acknowledgement of Assyrian overlordship and the attendant recognition of Assyria's gods, the theological foundations of the monarchy, Yahweh's eternal choice of Zion and David, were thrown into question. J. Bright in Peake's Commentary on the Bible. Quite simply, the prophecy of a virgin birth fulfilled in Jesus, although repeated a millionfold in every nation that ever succumbed to the psychosis of Christianity, is pious rubbish from beginning to end. The prophet Isaiah could not see beyond the end of his nose. In passing, it's worth noting that in the time of Hezekiah's great-grandson, Josiah, Assyrian power did indeed collapse, but even that did not save the house of David. Egypt, under Pharaoh Necho, was now an energetic ally of a weakened Assyria, and Necho's army destroyed Josiah and his warriors on the way north to aid the Assyrians. Within twenty years, Judah was no more, conquered by the new superpower, Babylon. The line of the kings of Judah came to an end, and the hate-filled ramblings and vainglorious promises of Isaiah were exposed as the pious nonsense that they ever were. Your people shall inherit the land forever. 
The sons of the alien shall be your ploughmen and your vine dressers. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. You shall eat the riches of the Gentiles. Instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Isaiah sixty twenty one. How wrong can you be? Instead of Gentile servants and a double portion, the Jewish elite were exiles in a foreign land. With their poster boy Josiah eliminated and the divinic line at an end, emigre priests in Babylon began fabricating Judaism anew with further updates to Isaiah. A census, straight from the pages of Josephus. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The census took place while Cyrenius was governing Syria, so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. So says Luke 2.1. Now Cyrenius came at this time into Syria, being sent by Caesar to be a judge of that nation. Cyrenius came himself into Judea, which was now added to the province of Syria, to take an account of their substance and to dispose of Archelaus's money. So says Josephus in Antiquity of the Jews. Luke combines the idea of Jesus as a Galilean from Nazareth with the somewhat conflicting idea that Jesus also fulfilled the prophetic promise that the Messiah would arise from the city of David, that is Bethlehem, 70 miles further south in Judah. Whereas Matthew's yarn moves the Holy Family from a hometown of Bethlehem to a new residence in Nazareth on the pretext of escaping the nasty Archelaus, a son of Herod, and they thus come to settle in Galilee where another son of Herod, Antipas, happens to rule, Luke moves the trio in the opposite direction from Nazareth to Bethlehem. The move is purely temporary and is accompanied by no anxieties about nasty Herodian princes. Luke's reason given for the journey, undertaken with a wife heavily pregnant, is decidedly dubious, a census of all the world, requiring everyone to return to his own city, not that is the place of normal domicile, but the ancestral seat of the family. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Luke 2.4 Joseph says Luke goes to Bethlehem not because he was born there, but because King David had been a thousand years earlier. The nonsense of such a proposition is palpable. The tale also illustrates how the author of Luke was heavily dependent on the work of Josephus for his historical accuracy. Josephus provided Luke with all the tidbits he needed about the registration in Judea of 6 AD for him to construct the brief preamble to the Nativity Tale. But even Josephus does not vouch for a worldwide registration, and neither does anyone else. The Romans certainly conducted censuses. The word itself originated in ancient Rome, and during the Republican era, the officer censor was a respected sacred magistrate. Its duties involved both the registration of citizens and their property and the maintenance of public morals. The censors are to determine the generations, origins, families and properties of the people, so said is Cicero. On the lists at Rome, citizens were registered by tribe and class. Slaves like cattle appeared under property. Augustus is known to have taken a census of Roman citizens at least three times, in 28 BC, 8 BC and 14 AD. Claudius ordered a census in Egypt in 45 AD, but Luke is not even clear when his Jesus was born. 
If the birthing of Jesus had occurred during the reign of Herod the Great, as it says in Luke 1.5, then there would not have been any Roman census in the kingdom of his client king, who conducted his own tax regimen, and in any event, censuses were forbidden under Jewish law. One of the reasons why client kingdoms were subsequently absorbed into the empire was precisely to increase the efficiency of tax collection. If, on the other hand, Luke's birthing occurred during the registration that was conducted in Judea in 6 AD, as it says in Luke 2.2, and he certainly was referring to that event, then the bounds of the ancient tribal settlements never stable and long since abandoned by the Jews, were of no interest to Roman tax officials. Shortly before the census, the territory of Judea, together with Samaria and Idumea, had been added to Syria and placed under a Roman prefect. But the Tectarchy of Galilee remained under the rule of Archelaus's brother Antipas until the latter's own banishment many years later by Caligula. Joseph, as a resident of this tiny client principality, not part of the newly created Judean province, would not have needed to travel to Bethlehem in Judea, and his betrothal, Mary, would not have needed to travel at all.